Manners, who was the worst bridezilla groomzilla that you've had to deal with? Story one, I remember it like it was yesterday. The venue was set. Beautiful outdoor setting with those big white tents, fairy lights strung overhead, and the works. We had pulled out all the stops for this one. We're talking five course meals, an open bar, and a staff of 20 just to keep everything running smoothly. All in all, a $60,000 reception, so we knew it had to be perfect. But you know, perfection is a tricky thing. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many times you check the details, something can always go wrong. And on that day, it was a knife. One knife, one tiny microscopic spot on a single knife. The mother of the bride was the first to notice it. She had one of those eagle eyes, the type that could spot a speck of dust from across the room. I didn't think much of it at first. We always have a backup plan for situations like this. Swap out the knife, make sure she's happy, and carry on. I mean, people usually don't even notice these things, but this lady? Oh, she noticed. And she wasn't just a little annoyed. No, she was furious. She called me over, waving that knife like it was Exhibit A in a courtroom. Her face was a shade of red I hadn't seen before, and I've seen a lot of angry faces in this business. This is unacceptable, she hissed through gritted teeth, holding the knife up as if it were evidence of a crime. I looked at the knife. One little spot. Could have been water. Could have been anything. And it wasn't like it was dirty. It wasn't some giant smear of food or grease. But to her, it was as if I had insulted the very institution of marriage. I want the entire reception comped, she demanded. We paid for perfection, and this, she held up the knife again for emphasis, is not perfection. Now, at this point, my heart rate is picking up because I'm doing the mental math. This reception costs 60 grand. 60. Thousand. Dollars. I've been in the business long enough to know that people get picky, and sometimes you have to give a little. Maybe offer a discount or a free bottle of champagne. But an entire reception? Over a knife? That wasn't happening. I tried to reason with her. Ma'am, I completely understand your concern. Let me get that knife replaced right away. We'll make sure everything else is spotless. But she wasn't having it. She crossed her arms, lifted her chin, and declared, No, this is a complete failure. I demand the whole thing be free. Now, at this point, I'm wondering if she's serious. Surely she can't think a tiny smudge on one piece of silverware is grounds for a free reception. But the look in her eyes told me she was dead serious. Meanwhile, the bride and groom, blissfully unaware of this chaos, were having the time of their lives with their friends. They were on the dance floor, laughing and spinning around, completely detached from the drama that was brewing in the corner of the tent. But the mother of the bride? She was laser-focused. Her entire day, maybe even her entire life, had come down to that one knife. And she wasn't backing down. I knew I needed backup. I got the event planner involved, hoping she could calm things down. Maybe some professional diplomacy could smooth this over. The planner listened to the mother, nodding and offering sympathetic, uh-huhs. But when it came down to the final ask, comping the entire event, she looked at me like, are you hearing this? We weren't just going to write off 60 grand, no matter how angry the mother was. But in the end, it didn't matter what we said. The more we tried to reason with her, the more she dug in. I don't care what you say, she said, voice rising. This whole thing is a disgrace. We will not be paying a dime. Now here's the kicker. She wasn't even the one footing the bill. The father of the bride, a quiet, easygoing guy, had been handling all the finances. He came over once he noticed things were escalating. You could see the moment of realization hit him when he heard his wife demanding the entire reception be free. He looked at me, then at her, and back at me. He sighed. I'll write the check, he said, cutting off his wife mid-rant. It's fine. We'll talk about this later. And just like that, the storm was over. The mother gave one last huff, but she didn't argue with him. She knew the battle was lost. She walked off in a huff, muttering under her breath about how she'd never been so disrespected in her life. Story two. So here I am just another Saturday working for this wedding planner I've helped out a few times. The day had been running smooth as butter, which, if you've ever worked a wedding, you know is a minor miracle. Vendors were on time, the flowers looked perfect, and everyone was in high spirits. We were about 45 minutes from the ceremony starting, and I'm thinking to myself, we might actually pull this off without any drama, but you know how life goes. Just when you think you're in the clear, chaos comes knocking. That's when one of the bridesmaids, a frazzled-looking woman with wild eyes and half her hair still pinned up, rushes over to me. She grabs me by the arm, and I can see the panic written all over her face. The bride forgot her shoes, she says, like it's the end of the world. At first, I figure, okay, not a big deal. We'll find something. Someone's bound to have a pair of shoes she can borrow. But no, this wasn't just any pair of shoes. Apparently, these were the shoes, specially chosen to match her dress, probably costing more than my rent, and the bride had absolutely convinced herself she couldn't walk down the aisle without them. I try to stay calm and ask, All right, where are the shoes? 
the bridesmaid grimaces. They're an hour away. Now I'm thinking, why are the shoes an hour away? But it doesn't matter. We've got a ticking clock, and I've learned over the years not to ask too many questions when things start going south. So I get the wedding planner, and we go talk to the bride. She's in the dressing room, already in her gown, looking every bit the picture-perfect bride, except for the fact that she's barefoot and freaking out. The planner, cool as ice, says, Look, no one's going to notice if you don't have the shoes. You'll be fine. We can get started. It's not worth holding up the whole wedding for this. Now at this point, I'm thinking surely the bride will realize that it's just shoes. She's got a wedding to think about, but no, absolutely not. She wasn't having it. She throws a fit full-on bridezilla mode, insisting that the wedding can't happen unless she has her shoes. The shoes are a non-negotiable, apparently. I mean, she's in tears, mascara running, the whole deal. The planner tries again to reason with her, but the bride won't budge. She orders, yes, orders her uncle to drive an hour out to get the shoes. The poor guy doesn't even look like he wants to argue. He just nods, hops in the car, and takes off. And so we wait. Now, as the minutes tick by, people are starting to notice something's up. The guests are seated, looking around, wondering why there's a delay. The family is particularly confused, especially since a good chunk of them had flown in from another country. They didn't speak much English, so they had no clue what was going on. All they knew was that they were supposed to be watching a wedding, and instead, they're just sitting there, in a hot venue, with nothing happening. Time keeps slipping away. The planner and I keep going back to the bride, begging her to just start the ceremony. She can wear someone else's shoes or even go barefoot. It was an outdoor wedding anyway, so it could have been charming. But she's not hearing it. Every time we ask, she digs her heels in. Pun intended. Saying she's not walking down the aisle without those shoes. I mean, this is a full-blown meltdown over footwear. As the wait stretches into hours, the guests start getting restless. You can hear the grumbling, the shifting in seats. People are checking their watches, standing up, milling around, and a few of them just decide they've had enough. I watched as some of them, clearly frustrated, walked right out of the venue. They didn't even say goodbye, just quietly slipped away, probably wondering why they had wasted their time for nothing. We go back to the bride and let her know, people are leaving. You're losing your guests, but it's like she's in another world. All she cares about are those shoes, not the fact that her wedding's falling apart, not that people who traveled across the globe to be here are leaving. Just the shoes. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the uncle comes back, holding those precious shoes like they were made of gold. The bride lights up like a kid on Christmas morning, slips them on, and suddenly all is right in her world again. She's all smiles now, ready to walk down the aisle as if nothing happened. But here's the thing. By the time the ceremony finally starts, we're already an hour and a half behind schedule. Some of the guests are visibly annoyed, others have already left, and there's this weird tension in the air that you can't shake. I mean, half the people are still trying to figure out why everything was delayed in the first place. When we finally get to the reception, it's like the energy has just evaporated. The crowd's thinned out. Easily half the people are gone. The music's playing, the food's out, but it feels like we're just going through the motions. I could see it on the planner's face. She knew this was a disaster, even if the bride didn't. Story 3. This story takes me back to one of those classic I told you so moments, but on a much grander wedding size scale. Let me paint you a picture of what went down. Now, I wasn't a wedding planner or anything fancy, but I happened to witness this catastrophe unfold firsthand. It was a week before my own wedding, and my fiancé and I were at the venue for a final meeting with the planner. Little did we know, we were about to get front row seats to one of the most memorable wedding mishaps I've ever seen. It started out pretty innocently. The venue we picked had a package deal that included everything. The works, venue, catering, decorations, and of course, a wedding cake made by their professional in-house baker. Seemed simple enough, right? But here's the twist. The bride and her mother, for the wedding the week before ours, decided they didn't want the package cake. Nope. The mother of the bride had this grand idea that she would bake the wedding cake herself. You could feel the tension in the air when they insisted on it, and it didn't take long to see why. Apparently, the mom had been baking for years, so she figured, why pay extra when I can do it myself? Now I can't fault anyone for trying to save a few bucks or add a personal touch to the big day. But making a multi-tier wedding cake for a large event is a whole other beast. The venue's wedding planner, who handles dozens of weddings at that hall each year, tried to gently warn them. She explained that if they were going to put a heavy cake topper on the cake, they'd need some structural support, like a stand in the middle to keep everything balanced. The mother of the bride waved her off. Oh, I know what I'm doing, she said, with the kind of confidence you really only get from decades of home baking for family holidays. According to her, the three layers of cake she had whipped up were more than sturdy enough to hold the large, intricate figurine they had chosen as the cake topper. Now, this wasn't some tiny little bride and groom statuette. From what I could see from a distance, 
It looked like a small sculpture, practically a centerpiece all on its own. Fast forward to the day of the wedding. My fiancé and I were sitting down with the venue's planner, going over the final details of our own reception. We were in one of the side rooms, but the door was open, and we had a clear view of the reception hall where the other wedding was getting set up. And right there, in the middle of it all, was this towering three-tier cake, topped with that massive figurine. I didn't think much of it, but the planner? She couldn't stop glancing at it. You could see it in her eyes. Something about that cake was bothering her. The whole time we were discussing our plans, she kept apologizing for being distracted. It just doesn't look right, she kept muttering half to herself. At one point, she even stood up to get a closer look before sitting back down, still looking uneasy. And then, right as we were about to wrap things up, I'll never forget the moment. The planner suddenly lets out this loud gasp and shoots up from her chair. Before we even knew what was happening, she was running toward the cake like it was on fire. My fiancé and I turned around just in time to see the disaster unfold. The cake topper, this huge, heavy figurine, had finally given in to gravity. It was like watching something happen in slow motion. The entire topper just sank into the cake, pushing straight down through the top layer, then the second layer. And finally, it burst through the front of the bottom tier. The whole front of the cake crumbled away, leaving a pile of cake bits and frosting splattered across the table. It was a complete and total cake massacre. I've seen some wedding mishaps before, but this was something else. The entire front of the cake was ruined. It looked like someone had taken a sledgehammer to it. I don't know if it was the weight of the topper, the lack of support, or just bad luck, but that cake didn't stand a chance. The bride's mother, who had been so sure of her skills, was nowhere to be seen at that moment, which was probably for the best. I can't imagine the look on her face when she saw what had happened. I mean, that cake was her pride and joy, the one thing she had insisted on doing herself. And now? It was just a pile of crumbs and smeared frosting. The wedding planner was doing her best to fix the situation, but there was only so much you could do at that point. I saw her waving over some of the staff, trying to salvage what was left of the back part of the cake. But honestly, the damage was done. It wasn't like they could run out and buy a new wedding cake on the spot. At that point, my fiancé and I decided it was time to get out of there. We figured the last thing the planner needed was two more people hovering around while she tried to clean up the wreckage. So, we left before we could see how they handled the aftermath. But I can only imagine the scramble that went down to try and fix that mess. As we were walking out, I couldn't help but think about what that planner had said earlier about needing that support in the cake. She'd tried to warn them, but sometimes people just don't want to listen. I guess the moral of the story is, if a professional tells you that you need something to keep your cake from collapsing, maybe just take the advice. Story 4. It was late, probably around 11.45 p.m., and the night was winding down. The venue was buzzing with that end-of-the-night energy. Guests were either too tired or too drunk to dance, but still hanging on for those last few minutes. The wedding was set to end at midnight and everything had been going relatively smooth up until that point. The bride was lovely. The ceremony had gone off without a hitch, and even the reception had been pretty drama-free. But as any event worker knows, nothing good ever happens after 11.30. The trouble started when we ran out of Grey Goose. Now, it wasn't like we were out of all alcohol, but for whatever reason, this groom had a real thing for Grey Goose vodka. I guess it made him feel like he was living large or something. He and his buddies had been pounding back drinks all night, and by this point, they were beyond wasted. So when one of the bartenders came up to me and said, we're out of Grey Goose, I knew we were about to have a problem. I'd barely processed the information when, out of nowhere, here comes the groom, barreling toward me like a bull seeing red. This guy was big too, tall, broad shoulders, the whole deal. He stomps up to me, eyes bloodshot, and starts jabbing his finger right in my face. Where's the Grey Goose? He slurs, his voice loud enough to rattle the glassware behind the bar. The guy reeked of alcohol, and I could tell he wasn't in a talking. This was full-on aggression. Behind him, I could see his poor bride, shrinking back like she wanted to disappear. She was clearly mortified, but too afraid or embarrassed to step in. We're out, I explained calmly, keeping my cool despite the fact that this guy was practically screaming in my face. It's almost midnight, and we've run out of Grey Goose. We still have other drinks available if you'd like something else. But that wasn't good enough for him. Oh no, the fact that we'd run out of his beloved Grey Goose vodka 15 minutes before the end of the wedding was apparently a personal insult. You're telling me, he bellowed, swaying slightly, that I paid all this money for this wedding and you can't even keep the Grey Goose stock? What kind of place is this? Now this wasn't exactly an upscale, top-shelf-only kind of event. They had a basic package with a limited bar and we'd gone through the goose faster than expected. But trying to explain that to a guy who was three sheets to the wind was a lost cause. He kept pointing and yelling, getting louder with every sentence. And his buddies? Well, they were just egging him on, 
laughing and chanting, Goose! 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 Like a bunch of frat boys who hadn't matured past their college days. At this point, I knew I had two options. Let him keep raging until he burned himself out or get creative. And since I wasn't about to let this guy ruin the last few minutes of the night for everyone else, I opted for the latter. I grabbed one of the empty gray goose bottles from behind the bar. It was pristine, save for the fact that it was bone dry. Then, without skipping a beat, I filled it up with water. Yep, plain old tap water. I figured, what are the chances this guy is even sober enough to tell the difference? With a smile, I walked over to the groom and his crew, holding the freshly refilled bottle like I had just found a hidden stash. Here you go, I said, pouring the water into a glass like it was liquid gold. The groom's face lit up. Now we're talking, he shouted, grabbing the glass and downing it in one gulp. His buddies followed suit, drinking their water like it was the finest vodka money could buy. I stood there, watching in disbelief as this group of grown men threw back glass after glass of water, convinced it was the gray goose they'd been demanding. I couldn't help but smirk as they high-fived each other and went on about how great the night had been. Story 5 So my friend, the bride, had spent months crafting these beautiful handmade decorations for her wedding reception. She wasn't the kind of bride to leave everything to vendors. She wanted her personality in the detail, things that were special and unique to her and her husband-to-be. I'm talking hours of gluing, cutting, painting, and putting these things together. The kind of decorations you just knew she had put her heart and soul into. They weren't expensive or professionally done, but they were hers. Fast forward to the wedding day. Everything seemed to be going smoothly. We were up in the bridal suite, getting our hair and makeup done, sipping champagne, laughing, typical pre-wedding excitement. I was the bridesmaid assigned to check on the reception setup to make sure everything was going according to plan while the bride was getting ready. You know, just keeping things on track so there wouldn't be any surprises. I headed down to the reception hall, expecting to see all of those beautiful handmade decorations hanging proudly, just like the bride had envisioned. But when I walked in, I immediately noticed something was off. The decorations? Nowhere to be found. Instead, the place looked bare. Sure, the venue was lovely on its own, but there was no sign of the personal touches the bride had worked so hard on. Confused, I looked around and spotted the wedding planner, who was busy directing the staff. I walked over and casually asked, Hey, where are the decorations the bride made? Shouldn't they be up by now? Her response? I kid you not. She looked at me, shrugged, and said, Oh, I didn't like them, so I didn't put them up. Wait, what? At first, I thought maybe I'd heard her wrong. I blinked a couple of times, trying to process what she just said. Didn't like them? That wasn't her call to make? These were the bride's decorations, something she had spent hours working on. I stood there, dumbfounded, as the planner just continued with whatever she was doing, completely unbothered by the fact that she had basically hidden away a key part of the bride's vision. That's when I spotted a box tucked under the guest book table. Sure enough, it was full of the bride's handmade decorations, all carefully packed away like they didn't belong. My blood was boiling at this point. I mean, how could she just decide not to use them because she didn't like them? It wasn't her wedding. Knowing the bride would be absolutely heartbroken if she came down and saw that her decorations weren't up, I quickly realized I had to take matters into my own hands. I wasn't about to let her big day get derailed over someone else's opinion. So I grabbed the boyfriend of one of the other bridesmaids, bless his soul for being there, and asked if he could help me hang up the decorations. Without missing a beat, he jumped in. We grabbed the box and started pulling everything out, frantically hanging the decorations around the room. We weren't exactly pros at this, but we got it done. Banners, garlands, little paper flowers, all the things the bride had lovingly crafted went up. The clock was ticking and I was sweating a little, but we managed to finish just in time. The planner saw us putting everything up and shot me a look, but I didn't care. I wasn't about to let her ruin my friend's wedding because she thought the decorations weren't up to her standards. Once everything was in place, I ran back up to the bridal suite like nothing had happened. When the bride finally came down to the reception hall later, her face lit up. She saw her decorations hanging just like she'd envisioned, and you could tell it meant the world to her. The planner? Well, she didn't say a word about it. Maybe she realized she'd crossed a line, or maybe she was just too busy to argue. Either way, I was relieved that we managed to fix things before the bride ever knew there had been a problem. Story 6. The day started off. Well, let's just say it set the tone. The first hiccup? The cake. I'm not one of those people who get super picky about things, but when I saw the cake, I did a double take. It was supposed to be this elegant white creation with subtle floral accents, but what showed up? Let's just say it was colorful. Like, a lot more colorful than planned. The whole thing had this weird tint, and it didn't exactly match the vibe we were going for, but hey, it was still cake, right? As long as it tasted good, I wasn't about to make a fuss. Then there was the bridal suite. It was supposed to be this luxurious space for me to get ready and unwind before the ceremony. But as soon as we got there, 
we found out the air conditioning was busted, and we were smack in the middle of a hot spell, so it was like walking into a sauna. The venue, trying to be accommodating, gave us a replacement cabin. It sounded like a decent alternative, until we walked in and were immediately greeted by a swarm of mosquitoes. I swear, it was like something out of a nature documentary. Those little bloodsuckers were everywhere. Now this is where our wedding planner really started to feel the pressure. You could see it on her face every time she had to deliver another piece of bad news. She'd approach us slowly, take a deep breath, and then, with this look of pure dread, tell us what had gone wrong. When she told us about the mosquito-filled cabin, I think she was bracing herself for a meltdown. But instead, we just shrugged. I mean, we packed citronella candles for a reason, right? She blinked at us, clearly confused by our lack of outrage. I could almost see the wheels turning in her head, like she was trying to figure out why we weren't flipping out. The truth? We just didn't care enough to let it ruin our day. We had bigger things to think about, like getting married, for instance. Then came the ceremony. The efficient, bless his heart, was running late. Apparently, he'd gotten stuck in traffic or something, but we weren't too worried. These things happen. But when he finally showed up, that's when things really took a turn for the hilarious. We're standing there, all eyes on us, the moment's building, and the efficient starts the ceremony by calling us by the wrong names. Now, let me tell you, my husband, not amused. I, on the other hand, couldn't stop laughing. I mean, here we are, standing at the altar, and the guy can't even get our names right. It's like something straight out of a sitcom. The efficient eventually corrected himself, but the damage was done. My husband was still shaking his head, and I was grinning like a fool. That was pretty much the cherry on top of the whole day. After everything else that had gone sideways, the cake, the sweet, the mosquitoes, the late efficient, it just felt like par for the course. But again, we rolled with it. We still got married, and that's what really mattered to us. The real fun was watching our wedding planner try to navigate all of this. She was new to the venue. This was only her second wedding there, and the lady at the front desk had warned us that the wedding the week before ours had been absolutely insane. You could tell the planner was still a little rattled from whatever went down at that one. I never found out the details, but from what we heard, it had been pure chaos. Honestly, I'd love to hear the stories from that wedding, because if it was crazier than ours, I can only imagine the level of disaster they were dealing with. But here's the thing. Every time she came to us with bad news, you could see her stealing herself for our reaction. She'd take a deep breath, center herself, and then, bam, hit us with whatever had gone wrong. And every time, without fail, we were just like, uh no big deal. And she would look so confused. It was like we were breaking the rules of wedding stress. I'll never forget the look on her face after the whole efficient debacle. I think she was fully expecting my husband to blow up, but instead he just sighed, gave me a little smile, and went back to focusing on the fact that, you know, we were getting married. The poor planner seemed downright baffled that we weren't losing it over all the things that had gone wrong. I could tell she wasn't used to couples taking things in stride like that. But that's just how we are, I guess. Sure, things went wrong. Plenty of things. But at the end of the day, we still had a cake, even if it was the wrong color. We ended up with a private cabin, mosquitoes and all. The citronella worked, except for the hot tub area, but who's counting? And most importantly, we were married. All the other stuff? It just made for a good story. Story 7. The way she tells it, it doesn't matter who you are, rich, poor, pushy, laid back, everyone's got their family baggage. And weddings tend to bring all of that bubbling right up to the surface. She's seen every kind of family dynamic you can think of. Families where there are three stepdads and nobody's sure which one is supposed to walk the bride down the aisle. Families where divorced parents can't stand to be in the same room, so they're trying to stay on opposite ends of the reception. Families that seem picture perfect from the outside, but behind the scenes, there's so much tension you could cut it with a knife. One time, she had a couple where the bride's parents were divorced, and the mom had remarried this new guy that absolutely nobody in the family liked. Not even the bride. So, of course, that led to this whole fiasco where the mom wanted her new husband front and center during the ceremony, while the bride just wanted her biological dad to walk her down the aisle. It was a standoff that lasted weeks before the wedding. My friend had to play referee, trying to keep everyone happy without the whole thing blowing up. I think in the end, they compromised with both dads walking her down the aisle, but not before a few very heated arguments. Then there was another wedding where the groom's dad had remarried a much younger woman, like way young, closer in age to the bride, actually. And that caused all kinds of awkwardness. The bride's mom couldn't stand to be near her, and the bride herself didn't know how to handle it. So there was this unspoken tension the whole day. My friend said she spent half the reception just trying to keep them from being seated too close to each other. She says it's like, no matter how much planning you do, no matter how much effort you put into making the day perfect, family dynamics are going to find a way to mess things up. You can have the best flowers, the most gorgeous venue, and the perfect weather. 
But none of that matters if Aunt Susan and Cousin Nancy haven't spoken in 15 years and decide the reception is the place to reignite their old feud. And believe me, she's seen that happen more than once. One of the things she's seen time and time again is how weddings seem to bring out the worst in people. Even the nicest folks can suddenly become demanding or entitled when it comes to their wedding day. They want things exactly the way they've envisioned, and they don't care if it's unreasonable or if it makes life difficult for the planner, the venue staff, or even their own family members. She once had a bride who wanted the reception tablecloths to be precisely one shade of ivory, a shade that basically didn't exist anywhere except in the bride's mind. The poor staff had to go through at least a dozen fabric samples, none of which were right, until the bride finally settled on something that was close enough. And don't even get her started on the gifts and card boxes. She told me that people stealing the gift or card box happens more often than you'd think, and it's never who you'd expect. You'd think guests at a wedding would be all love and good vibes, but nope. Apparently, some folks see those card boxes as an opportunity. These things are stuffed with cash, checks, and gift cards, so they're an easy target for someone with sticky fingers. She says it's a lot more common than anyone is comfortable admitting. You've got people there to celebrate a happy couple, and in the middle of all that, someone's thinking, hey, maybe I'll make off with a couple grand in cash. One time, there was a wedding where the card box just vanished. No one noticed at first. It wasn't until the bride and groom went to open their gifts later that they realized the whole thing was gone. Imagine that, your big day, and someone's made off with the bulk of your gifts. The worst part is there's no easy way to track who did it. It could be a guest, a vendor, someone who just slipped in unnoticed. No one ever found out what happened to the box. It was just gone. My friend said it made her sick, knowing that on what's supposed to be the happiest day of their lives, someone had the nerve to steal from the couple. Story 8. I'll never forget this wedding. It's the kind of story that, as much as you wish it wasn't true, you couldn't make it up if you tried. The couple? Sweet as could be, but young and, well, a little too trusting. They had no idea what was about to hit them, and I don't think any of us did. Not at first, anyway. Everything that went down was a slow-motion train wreck we couldn't stop, no matter how hard we tried. It all started with the rehearsal. We were all set to go, waiting for this one person to show up. Now, I didn't know her too well, but she was apparently a family friend. Someone who had been around long enough that the couple trusted her to be a big part of the wedding. But right off the bat, she shows up late to the rehearsal, stumbling in like she had better things to do. You could already sense something was off, but we tried to roll with it. She was loud made inappropriate comments during the rehearsal dinner, and seemed completely oblivious to how uncomfortable she was making everyone. At one point, she actually made a joke at the groom's expense, something so awkward that it left the whole table in stunned silence. The bride, bless her heart, was trying to laugh it off, but you could see the tension building. The final straw was when she started knocking back drinks like it was her own personal party. I mean, this wasn't just casual sipping. She was getting sloppy fast. At this point, I realized someone needed to step in before things got worse. So I made the call to quietly escort her out before she completely derailed the evening. I pulled her aside, tried to gently tell her that maybe she should call it a night, but she wasn't having it. She argued, slurred a bit about how she was fine, but eventually she stumbled out the door with a half-hearted promise to be better tomorrow. If only that had been true. The next day, the day of the wedding, we hoped things would be smoother. I figured maybe she'd sleep it off and show up with a clearer head. But when I got to the venue, it became clear that this was going to be anything but a normal wedding day. First, she canceled most of the guests. Yeah, you read that right. Apparently, she got a hold of the guest list somehow, no idea how she managed that, and started calling people to tell them the wedding was off. Imagine being one of those guests, getting a last-minute call from someone claiming the wedding's been canceled when it very much wasn't. Some of them actually believed her and didn't show up. It wasn't until hours later that the bride and groom found out why half their guest list was suddenly no-shows, but that wasn't the worst of it. No, she also managed to cancel the catering. The catering! I still have no clue how she pulled that off, but by the time we realized what had happened, it was too late to fix it. You can imagine the panic when we found out there wouldn't be food for the reception. The venue scrambled to whip up something, but it was a disaster. We had an entire wedding party and guests who were expecting a full meal. And instead, we had to settle for whatever the venue could throw together at the last minute. The bride was trying to hold it together, but you could see the stress in her eyes. She hadn't expected any of this. Nobody had. And as for the groom, he was in shock, just trying to keep things moving forward, trying not to let the whole day fall apart. But the worst moment? That came when she went after the bride's dad. He was dying of cancer, and everyone knew this might be one of his last big moments with his daughter. He was frail but he'd made it to the wedding to walk his daughter down the aisle. For him, this day was everything. And this woman, this nightmare of a person, decided to pick a fight with him. 
I don't even remember what set her off, but it was like she snapped. She started yelling at him in front of everyone, saying things no decent person would ever say, let alone to a man who was clearly sick. And then, in the middle of the chaos, she actually laid hands on him, pushed him, or grabbed his arm, something physical. It was enough that he lost his balance and nearly fell. That's when everything exploded. The bride was in tears, her family rushed in, and someone called the cops. The entire wedding came to a screeching halt while everyone tried to figure out what the hell had just happened. The venue was buzzing with confusion, anger, and disbelief. The woman was still going off like she didn't even realize what she'd done. The cops showed up, and it took them a while to calm the situation down and get her out of there. You'd think that would be the end of it, but nope. The venue tried to pin some of the blame on me. I don't know how or why, but they actually threatened to sue me over what happened, as if I had anything to do with her actions. Maybe they were just covering their own tracks, trying to shift responsibility for the chaos that unfolded. Either way, it was a mess I never expected to find myself in. Story 9. I used to be a wedding DJ. Did it for years. Out of all the weddings I did, I'd say I only really messed up two out of about 80. Not a bad run, right? But let me tell you those two. They still haunt me. Weddings are emotional pressure cookers. And if you're on the clock as a DJ, you feel that pressure just as much as anyone else. The thing about weddings is, people come in with expectations so high you could practically touch the ceiling with them. Everyone wants it to be perfect. But if there's one thing I learned, it's that there's no such thing as a perfect wedding. Something always goes wrong, even if it's small. The couple is stressed out, families are on edge, and you've got a room full of guests who all want the day to go off without a hitch. And then there's you, the DJ, the guy who's expected to read everyone's mind and hit every cue just right. When that goes south, oh boy, here's what happens. If either the bride or groom is already nervous and freaking out, and then they come at you with last-minute changes, you're in for a rough ride. I had one wedding where the groom handed me a new song list two minutes before the ceremony started. I'd already worked off three different lists from the couple, and none of them matched up. Now, I'm used to working on the fly. It's part of the job. But when you're trying to keep things smooth, and then someone throws a fourth list at you with no time to prep, that's when the panic sets in. This was about ten years ago, but I still remember it like it happened yesterday. I was standing there, sweating bullets, trying to piece together the song order from these lists that didn't make any sense. And the worst part? The bride was already in tears when she arrived. When someone walks in crying before the ceremony even starts, you just know it's going to be a nightmare. Now, normally I could manage last-minute changes, but this wedding was different. The bride and groom were in full meltdown mode. The groom, especially, was all over the place. He'd spent days giving me conflicting song requests. And now, with just two minutes to go, he was demanding I switch everything up again. I didn't even have time to think, let alone plan. I was flipping through my playlists, trying to make sense of it all, while the clock was ticking down. At that moment, I started to panic. I could feel it in my chest, that tight, sinking feeling you get when you know things are going sideways and you can't stop it. The pressure was unreal. I'm scrambling, thinking I could maybe just wing it, but that was wishful thinking. The ceremony was starting, and nothing was in place. Then it happened. The groom, already stressed beyond belief, lost his cool. He stormed over to the DJ booth, yelling at me in front of everyone, saying I'd screwed everything up. I was still trying to figure out how to make it work, but he wasn't having it. He was livid and it didn't help that the bride was sobbing in the background. The whole thing was a disaster. And then, this is the kicker, I got kicked out. As in, they told me to leave, mid-ceremony. The groom was so furious he didn't even want me there anymore. He wasn't thinking straight, and I don't blame him. Weddings do that to people. But man, I've never been kicked out of anywhere before that. I packed up my gear, walked out of there with my tail between my legs, and that was it. The whole wedding felt like it was doomed from the start, but I couldn't help feeling like I'd let them down. I tried my best to juggle everything, but sometimes, no matter how hard you try, it just doesn't come together. That one stuck with me. I think about it every now and then, especially when I'm at an event or listening to someone else DJ a wedding. It was just one of those moments where everything that could go wrong did, and while I know it wasn't entirely my fault, it's hard not to carry a little bit of that guilt with you. The other wedding I messed up was different, more of a technical issue where the speakers cut out during the first dance. I got them back up in a couple minutes, but those few minutes felt like an eternity. The bride gave me a look that could melt steel, but we got through it, and the rest of the night went fine. But that wedding where I got kicked out? That one burned. People don't always realize how stressful it can be to DJ a wedding. You're not just pressing play on a playlist. You're managing emotions, reading the room, trying to keep a dozen things straight in your head while making sure every little detail is timed perfectly. And when things go wrong, people feel it. Weddings are emotional, and folks sometimes take it out on whoever's closest. I've been yelled at, spit at, and blamed for things way beyond my control. But I get it. 
Emotions run high, and people just want their day to be perfect. Story 10. Weddings bring out all kinds of emotions, but I'm telling you, nothing stirs up more drama than a meddling mother-in-law. Take this one wedding I heard about not too long ago. A buddy of mine got married, and his bride's mom? Hands down, one of the worst I've ever seen. It was like she'd taken it upon herself to turn what should have been a happy occasion into a nightmare. I still don't know how the couple made it through. The first sign of trouble came during the lead-up to the wedding, starting with the hen party, or the bachelorette party as we call it. Now, the bride had a solid group of six bridesmaids lined up, close friends she'd known for years. These were the girls she thought would be with her through thick and thin, especially on one of the biggest days of her life. But that all went up in flames the second her mom got involved. At the hen party, things went south fast. From what I've been told, the bride's mom micromanaged everything. She didn't just hover, she took over. I guess she figured that because she was footing part of the bill. She had the right to dictate how everything went down. Now, you'd think the hen party would be a fun, carefree night, but instead it turned into a power struggle. The mom was controlling everything. The food, the music, the decorations. She was telling everyone what to do, where to stand, what to wear, and who should talk to whom. It was ridiculous. It didn't stop there, though. Apparently, the mom had this knack for making everyone feel small. She was outright abusive. Snide comments, constant criticism, picking fights over nothing. At one point, she allegedly berated two of the bridesmaids so badly that they left the party in tears. And here's the kicker. Two of the bridesmaids were so fed up with her behavior that they refused to attend the wedding altogether. That's right. They didn't even show up. I mean, these are supposed to be your best friends, the people who stand by your side on your wedding day, and they couldn't bring themselves to be a part of it because of this woman. The fallout from that hen party was so bad that out of the original six bridesmaids, only two of them ended up staying in contact with the bride after the wedding. Four of them completely cut her off, and it wasn't even her fault. It was all because of the mom's toxic behavior. But that's how these things go sometimes. When someone causes that much chaos, it's hard not to get swept up in it, and relationships break down. Then came the wedding itself, and the mom's meddling only got worse. She wasn't just being controlling. She was running the whole show like it was her own event. The bride and groom? Practically sidelined. It wasn't their wedding anymore. It was the mother's. The real cherry on top was the whole hotel situation. The bride's mom had taken charge of booking the hotel accommodations for everyone. Guests, bridal party, family, the whole nine yards. Seemed nice, right? Like she was doing everyone a favor by organizing everything. But as it turns out, there was a catch. She had overcharged everyone. And not by a little. She jacked up the prices enough that it became pretty clear what she was doing. She was making everyone else's payments cover her own costs. Now, I don't know all the details about how the finances broke down, but it was bad enough that people were talking about it for weeks afterward. It wasn't until after the wedding that folks started comparing notes, realizing they'd all paid way more than they should have for their rooms. The bridesmaids, the groomsmen, even some of the bride's own family, they all got hit with inflated bills so that the mom could stay at the fancy hotel, drink at the bar, and probably pocket a little extra cash for herself. Needless to say, people were pissed, but by that point, the damage was done. The wedding was over, the money was spent, and the bride's relationship with most of her friends was shattered. It's hard to come back from something like that, you know? I can't imagine how awkward the months following that wedding must have been for the couple, especially with the bride's mom acting like she hadn't done a thing wrong. Story 11. So, fast forward to the day before the wedding. The deliveries start arriving at the venue, and I'm feeling pretty good about everything. Until, that is, I spot the napkins. I walk over, ready to check them off the list. But when I open the box, my heart sinks. They weren't the right shade of purple. Instead of the deep, rich tone I'd been imagining, they were this lighter, almost lavender color. To anyone else, it probably wouldn't have been a big deal. But to me, in that moment, it was everything. I lost it. There was this poor delivery manager just doing his job, and I completely tore into him. I knew it wasn't his fault. He didn't pick the napkins. He didn't choose the colors. He was just dropping stuff off. But I didn't care. In my head, the wrong napkins meant the whole wedding was teetering on the edge of disaster. I started going on and on about how we'd specifically ordered the exact shade, how I couldn't believe this was happening the day before the wedding, how it was unacceptable. I just kept going, letting all that pent-up stress explode on this guy who, bless him, stood there taking it. He kept apologizing, but that wasn't good enough for me at the time. I was in full bridezilla mode. Looking back, it was completely irrational. They were just napkins for crying out loud. But when you're so deep into wedding planning, every little thing feels like it could make or break the whole day. In my mind, I had this picture-perfect vision of how everything was supposed to look. And those napkins, those stupid napkins, weren't a part of it. 
After I finished my rant, the guy told me they'd see what they could do, but he made no promises. I knew deep down that there was probably no time to fix it before the wedding, but I wasn't ready to accept that yet. So I stormed off, still fuming, and spent the rest of the day stressing over it. And the thing is, I knew even then that I wasn't being reasonable. I was just stressed to the max, and the napkins were the final straw. The next day, the wedding went off without a hitch. People showed up, the flowers were gorgeous, the ceremony was beautiful, and not a single person noticed the napkins. In fact, I didn't even notice the napkins. Once the day started, I was too wrapped up in the moment, marrying the love of my life, to care about what shade of purple was on the table. That's the part that sticks with me now. All that stress, all that freaking out, and for what? A detail that nobody even cared about. I think weddings have a way of magnifying everything. You put so much pressure on yourself to make it perfect, to make every detail fit this idealized version you have in your head. And when something doesn't go according to plan, it feels like the end of the world. But it's not. The day is about so much more than napkins or flowers or centerpieces. I felt terrible afterward. I didn't get a chance to apologize to that delivery manager, but I wish I could have. He was just trying to do his job, and I made it way harder than it needed to be. It wasn't my proudest moment, not by a long shot, but it taught me a lesson I've tried to carry with me since. Sometimes things go wrong and it's okay. Not everything is going to be perfect, but that doesn't mean the day is ruined. In the grand scheme of things, what really matters is who you're marrying and the people who are there to celebrate with you.